It's time once again for another thrilling episode of Mark Out Radio. Of Mark Out Radio. For the next hour, sit back, pull the stick out of your ass, and enjoy. Be warned, though, smarks and internet know it alls will be offended, annoyed, and generally pissed off at what's about to happen to your ear holes. You've been warned. Now, Mark Out Radio. All right. Jesus. Shout out to Cannon. Voice sounding phenomenal. Good God. Marco Ready Goes Nitro. Dark Fox here with you. Episode 14, December 4th, 1995. Out of the America West Arena, Phoenix, Arizona. Hosted by Eric Bischoff, Bobby the Brain Heenan, and Steve Mongo McMichael. We've got a longer show than usual this week. Without commercials, it hits just over 55 minutes. The set is huge and much more lit up, of course. Brain has some weasel wafers, obviously throwing back to his stupid weasel gimmick. Um, You know, Mongo every week comes out and puts himself over with a stupid fucking dog. So Brain coming out, putting himself over with a fucking stupid raccoon tail hanging out a ruffle chips bag, I guess, is fair play. Because it's both equally fucking retarded. Anyways, Mongo's stupid dog... Is wearing an angel costume, and Bischoff is channeling his inner Indian. So that's always fantastic. Jesus. Everyone's just putting themselves over this week. I just... I just uh, sometimes I just... Uh, I, I, fuck, I wish I understood what was going through people's heads some days, if I'm honest with you. Like, I know I shouldn't. I know I should understand that at some point, everyone gets fucking full of himself and everything. Um, but Jesus fucking Christ. All right. First match of the night, Harlem Heat defeats the American Males in a, uh, what the hell are you talking about? No, 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 don't, don't, because, stop. D- Motherfucker, every time you play that, I get in trouble. Every time. Uh, every time, stop, seriously, fade it out. I'm going to throw something at your goddamn head. I really am. Thank you. Jesus. <laughs> Fucking hell. All right, you can't play that shit because, like, they get all angry at me on, on fucking YouTube. They, they Just the world WWE fucking music department, even though they didn't create the fucking song, comes after me every goddamn time. That's the third show. I guarantee you I'm going to be fighting this fight all week, claiming it's fucking fair use. All right, anyways. Uh, match goes 7 minutes 47 seconds. I gave it 3 out of 5. The American Males come out first, and uh, you'd think that... No, no, no! That's not a... Motherfucker. I should let it play and take it out of your goddamn salary, is what I should do. All right, thank you. Jesus. (laughs) Fucking keep playing that goddamn song. All right. Sorry. I think I gotta... I feel like I have to train a new producer, is what's gonna happen. I I just... I I feel like I gotta go there. No, no, that's not an invitation. Motherfucker. All right, I'm turning you down so that I don't have to <laughs> fight the fight on goddamn YouTube. All right. America males come out first. You think they get a huge pop being the rocker ripoffs that they are, but it just looks like they prefer ring rats and the live camera catches a whole row of people. One of them, perhaps a swinger, booing the shit out of them. So, oops, um, that didn't quite work out the way you'd hope it for, did it? We coming for you, nigga. That's right, they are because those are your boys, Harlem Heat, coming out. And I'm not saying the goddamn word. Don't even look at me funny. WCW wanted so bad for these guys to recapture the Hollywood Blondes Heat, uh, but they just flopped. I mean, Harlem Heat got a bigger pop, and I really liked Heat despite their nation of domination type militant, angry black guy gimmick. I never really got it, but then again, I wasn't raised to be a fucking racist or something, so probably that's the reason why I don't get it. Uh, Booker and Bagwell were clearly the more talented guys in their teams. And when they were working together in the ring, it was actually a thing of beauty. Colonel Parker comes out and gives Sherry a black lacy robe thing and a ring. So, of course, she leaves with him. No. Stop. God damn it. Booker starts chirping with some random black fan. The cameras and the announce team put it over. Not an awesome idea. Crowds can be a little weird. Sometimes they can take that as an invitation to get even more involved in the show. And sure enough, as the match was going out, 
the event security and some backstage staff were out there to put an end to it, but there was still some post-match chirping, and of course the guy was on camera again. I didn't see him the rest of the night, so I don't know if he got escorted out. Actually, that's not true. I did see him again during the Sting match, but then after that I didn't see a whole lot of him anymore. Um, and I could also do without the Sherry Parker shitty love story angle. Um, these guys are all great tag team wrestlers and don't need this stupid gimmick distracting from what's going on. No. No, no, seriously. <laughs> Fuck off. Jesus. All right. <clears throat> After this, Sting Luger promo with Gene on the ramp. A decade of friendship is friendship, and Luger has a good chance of getting the belt off of Macho tonight, and Sting's got a triple threat, excuse me, a triangle match for the number one contendership at Starcade. Around this time, Sting stopped taking steroids, which was one of the things that he and Luger would actually legit fight about in real life. Sting's flexibility and athleticism approved, but his pecs and biceps got positively tiny by comparison. He was much smarter than his old friends, Luger and Warrior. One, of course, has a degenerative disease, and the other had a heart attack that killed him before he was 55. So, probably a good idea to get off the fucking juice. I just throwing that out there to you workout fans that pay attention to the show. Apparently, there's been a few, because I'm getting emails now, because I'm not putting over people's physiques enough. I'm a straight... I'm a straight dude. I, I, I'm not going to put over people's physiques like wax philosophical, but I'm sorry. If, you, if you're tuning in to hear me wax philosophical about the size of guys, you're really barking up the wrong tree. I mean, just uh, leave that up to fucking Alvarez and fucking Dave to put over people's physiques like creepy bullshit. Anyways, after that, Sting defeats Kurosawa in 238. I gave that one two out of five. Sting high fives this black guy who was tripping Booker earlier. He must have been some sort of VIP. I don't know who he was. I feel like an asshole. I mean, like, if you, if you know who he was, like, feel free to email or comment and tell me what an idiot I am for not knowing who this fucking guy is, but I just don't. I'm sorry. I just, I, I, it's just call it ignorance, I guess. I don't know. Kurosawa is getting really fucking fat, and his left pec and arm were discolored. I'm not quite sure what the fuck is going on. The match itself is a bit of a squash match, perhaps because Sting's getting a little bit of a title push here, but also perhaps Kurosawa has really let himself go, and WCW wants to sort of punish him, I guess. During the match, we get uh, notified that Flair, Hogan, and Macho are on notice from the executive committee, and they have had enough of wrestlers laying hands on officials, brother. So fucking stop it because that's not it's not as though that's not an integral part refs taking bumps is kind of an integral part you don't want to have it in every single show but a ref bump can be pretty fun after this we're gonna starcade promo and starcade's theme this year is japan versus the usa so new japan invades the usa invades wcw really after that there's a saturday night promo coming back from the break and then we got the giant with jimmy hart and the taskmaster at his side, defeating Scott Norton in 243. I gave that one two out of five. Um, I don't know. It was okay. I mean, in his interviews on his time at WCW, White, uh, that's the giant's real name, anyways, said that the only time he was ever actually worried in the ring was when he was facing Norton since he was such a freakishly strong dude. Uh, Bischoff puts over the show going long since the C in WCW now apparently stands for committed. Here I thought it stand for championship. Nothing to do with the NBA game that was booked afterwards that was delayed due to the visiting team's plane arriving late because of a blizzard blowing into town. But, I mean, it's a pretty good way to take advantage of something that just sort of happened. I guess TNA gave them the green light to go late, and WCW wanted to take advantage of that, so they pushed back a couple of matches and made promos a little longer than they really should have. And then, of course, they have this whole... Charles Barkley flair thing. Now don't get me wrong. It wasn't a Phoenix suns game. And I'm not saying that Charles Barkley was like there because they were actually in the arena where the suns play. It was other NBA teams. Cause at the time TNT was well known for broadcasting and commentating NBA games, but they just happened to play up a lot of NBA tonight. So it's just a coincidence, I guess. Anyways, Post-match giant just spits so bad in the camera. I'm sure they had to change the lens, giving his after-match screaming promo thing. Now, listen, 95, he won. What did he win here? Hold on. I think he, I think he won rookie of, no, the rookie of the year was Alex Wright. When did he win rookie of the year? Maybe it was the year before. It must have been the year before when he had his first run-in with Hogan. But, like, Jesus fucking Christ. I mean... It was it, it was it was fucking brutal. 
I mean, it, let's be honest, it was brutal. Now, in the uh, after Starcade, what is it here? Oh yeah, right. There's there's a Christmas Nitro, and we'll do a year in review thing where I give you all the Hall of Fame members and all the accolades they won and shit like that. But for now, let's just say that. Um, well, let's just say that it was a little bit odd that Giant should win amateur of the year or newbie of the year considering the extent of his promos were having kevin sullivan gyrating in a lump on the ring having jimmy hart also run his mouth for him and basically just giant screaming a lot saying oh i'm gonna, I'm gonna curse you oh, like it was i know people give like macho and and warrior shit for their like screamy unintelligible promos but fuck sakes i mean they'll give those two shit for having screamy un fathomable promos and yet the giant gets the fucking nod as you know the newbie of the year go figure anyways after this flair comes out with charles barkley for an in-ring promo with gene sir charles gets some heat for showing up in the ring with the dirtiest player in the game but they get over with some cheap pops and then they end it all by barkley saying that flares his boy to a huge amount of boo i guess the entire thing of this was to sort of have Charles Barkley, like a local celebrity out there to show that the WCW is like the man, like they're the wrestling. They're not at war yet, of course, but they're just trying to show their street cred, I guess, because Barkley and Flair went, go out on the town every time Flair's in Arizona to like pick up ring rats and shit, which is, I don't know if he ever went out with Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley looks like a pretty straight laced kind of guy, but I do believe that Flair would go in pretty much any town and had rats in every single town. I would believe that. Anyways, uh, I guess the whole thing was to test the waters for a Hogan Flair program, which, I mean, yeah, the next week was going to be Hogan and Sting versus, I think it was Flair and Arn was the original booking. We'll see what happens with that. But, like, I don't know. The Hogan Flair thing has happened a couple of times. And it's happened a couple of times since Hogan showed up in WCW, and it happened, well, not really very well in WWE beforehand. But still, I mean, why do we need to go back to this fucking shit again? I don't know. I think it, I think mostly it was the idea of getting Charles Barkley out off the stage, excuse me, the ring, and putting over that uh, WCW was hooked up with the big boys. Anyways, after that, we got Luger with Jimmy Hart defeating Randy Savage via DQ in a WCW World Heavyweight Championship match. The match was 13 minutes, 56 seconds. I gave it four out of five. Now, just before you freak out, I'm not giving Macho Man matches huge scores. It's a legitimate score. It was a good match. It was my defensive fucking high pitched shit in my voice. Anyways, let's uh, let's go through the match itself. Luger's music works this week. Jimmy Hart has a new jacket, and you know, hold on, let's just pump the brakes for a second. You know, a lot of people give RVD credit for all the airbrushed bullshit in their ring gear, and then Ryback incorporated it. But like, what? Oh, you you want to all right fine play it it's it, it you have to play it right when i say it you know whoa whoa don't take your unrequited love for me out on poor ryback all right <laughs> i like ryback <laughs> what do you want from me no he was a decent wrestler he's a, a nice fucking guy all right fuck off fucking producer dickhead anyways nothing in pro wrestling compares to the wardrobe jimmy hart has of airbrush jackets and outfits and i again rvd gets all this fucking adulation and credit for being the, the quote unquote innovator of all this airbrushed ring gear. Yeah. Okay. So he's the innovator of having a onesie in the ring. Great. Awesome. Fucking, I hate Hogan and Jimmy Hart with his valet for fucking ever. So by proxy, I don't really like Jimmy Hart very much either, but let's give credit where credit's due. If you're going to give credit for somebody for bringing airbrushed bullshit into the wrestling world, uh, Jimmy Hart has to be your fucking nod. Let's be honest here. All right. Macho comes out looking awesome with no shirt on um, because like for relax, it's not a, it's not an ambiguously gay statement for the past like two months. He's been coming out to the ring and wrestling in a fucking muscle shirt. All right. This week he actually came out looking like a wrestler. Jesus. The camera focuses on some hot broad at ringside. I'm not sure why she was there, but she had on those like short shorts and a crop top. Fucking nice. And a good looking lady. Maybe I think maybe WCW was maybe testing the waters of a future Nitro's girls gimmick. I don't know. Listen, it's not going to hurt your brand and it's not going to hurt your viewership to have hot broads and little or no clothing at ringside. All right. If ECW proved anything, it's that that is accurate. Smarks love to bitch and moan about whether whenever a ring announcer calls out the time limit, that it's a tell that they're going to run the time limit and it's going to be a draw. 
It's never been true, but that certainly doesn't stop them. This match was billed as a 50-minute time limit that started five minutes before the end of the show. So from the word go, even though you knew that Nitro was going to go long, you knew that you probably weren't going to get the full 15, and you didn't. It was 13.56 before the DQ. But that doesn't stop people from going, well, anytime they say what the time limit is, that means it's going to be a draw. It's not true here. It's not true in AEW. It's not true in fucking Ring of Honor. Yeah, okay, WWE does it a lot more than they really should, but still, it's not a fucking infallible thing. Like, I get it. You've got a beef with it. It's fine. But it's not true, and it's never been true. It's just every now and then it happens, and then people freak out. They're like, oh, see? You see? You see? You can see it's happening right there. Your arms are just too short to box with God. During the match, we got a Starcade promo as we go to commercial break. And, you know, I got to say this. A lot can be said about Luger. You know, both positives and negatives. But he performed an excellent match with Savage, and Hart did an excellent job putting it all over at ringside, screaming into that stupid-ass megaphone of his. All right, so this is going to be practically a string of consciousness. So I'm, I'm going to apologize ahead of time, but, like, fuck's sakes. It was a lot of action to happen in a short amount of time and a lot of reaction from the fans at ringside, all right? So buckle in. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> The ref takes a bump after Luger gets tossed into an exposed turnbuckle that was exposed by Jimmy Hart. Flair comes in and downs Macho with a foreign object, a quote-unquote tape fist or Chicago knuckles, if you ask Mongo McMichael. Then he gets chased back into the ring by Hogan as he's trying to leave. The crowd pops huge. Hogan pushes the ref, who tries to count the one, two, three. The ref calls for a DQ because Hogan touched him. God forbid he touches him. Hogan double noggin knockers Luger into Hart and then goes to waffle Luger again because Luger didn't fall. Hart did. Luger ducks. Hogan nails Sting, who just slides into the ring. Sting pops up and shoves Hogan, who tears a shirt open and shoves Sting back. The fans at this point are losing their fucking minds, and Macho separates them as they go to break. Ooh, Jesus Christ, I got it all out there. Now listen, I know it sounds really like a lot of action to happen at once, and it is. And it sounds like you're forcing the fans to scream and then scream louder and scream louder and scream louder. And you are. That's what put it over. But that being said, think about the timing that had to be accomplished here. All right. The ref takes a bump after Luger takes a header into an exposed turnbuckle. I didn't even see Jimmy Hart expose the turnbuckle. I don't remember not hearing him constantly screaming through the megaphone. So the fact that he got the turnbuckle off without drawing attention from the announce team, the cameraman, or me watching way too goddamn closely for my own good, is pretty impressive. Now, when Luger takes the bump on the exposed turnbuckle and, and stumbles backwards into the ref, the ref takes a... Mm, is it, listen, for refs, it was a decent bump. Dumping over the middle rope and falling out of the ring to fuck off for a little bit. Here's where things start to go into high gear and where the timing has to be fucking impeccable so bookers and road agents that were backstage fucking hats off to you okay flair comes down with a foreign object which is this that taped fist gimmick that he and arn innocent like to use now listen they like to use it because basically what they do is they take a piece of half inch foam and they wrap athletic tape around it and then they nail somebody with it it's double safe because first of all your knuckles aren't actually going to hit the guy you're punching and second it looks like a quote-unquote foreign object as far as wrestling I guess kayfabe goes, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's very safe. That is the cue for the craziness to ensue because Flair gets out of the ring and goes back up the ramp. Now the fans pop because they saw Hogan sort of peek his head out at first. And listen, I'm not going to fucking shoot on that because it wasn't caught on camera. Flair was turning around, saw Hogan. You can see his eyes kind of widen a little bit and he turns back around. So his back is back is to the ramp and he's backing up chirping at the ring, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. He realized the spot was about to get fucked. So he fixed it. Hogan comes out. Flair backs into him. Hogan chases Flair back into the ring. Now here's where the fucking timing's got to be fucking spot on because Hogan gets into the ring just as the ref gets back into the ring and Luger's going to pin Macho. And 
Hogan stops the ref by touching him. God forbid he shoves him off of counting, but apparently the ref's pussy got hurt in this incident. So the ref calls for a DQ. Now things kick into fast forward here and there's a lot that has to happen really quickly. So Hogan grabs Luger and grabs Hart by the hair, pulls him into the ring, grabs Luger by the hair and does the double noggin knockers together. Hart takes the full bump, rolls out of the ring. So he's the fuck out of the way for the rest of what's going to happen. And it's fucking gold that he does it because he pirouettes like a fag and he gets out of the ring and it's great. Luger doesn't actually take the fall. He just sort of does the wobbly wobbly bullshit. So Hogan bounces off the ropes and goes to punch Luger. Just as he's winding up to hit Luger, Luger ducks and Sting gets into the ring just in time to get slugged. Uh, The fucking timing that would take to have Sting ready to run into the ring, even if he didn't run all the way from back, even if he was just at a camera shot and slid into the ring just at the right moment. Like that takes an awful lot of timing that WWE sometimes struggles with today. All right. Now the shoving match happens and all the fucking bullshit happens and that's fine. We go to break with the three faces, the three main event faces of the company shoving each other and getting each other's faces, which again, awesome, good, creates some heat. Only problem is that we've already seen this gimmick play out for fall brawl and fall brawl was only two months ago, three months ago. All right. So we've seen this dissension among the ranks before and it sucks that it's coming up again this fast, but there's really nothing else you can do. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying there's nothing. What else are you going to fucking do to get the three phases and put over the new champion? Cause Hogan keeps coming out and burying the new champion every fucking chance he gets with promos. All right, now, during the break, it appears that the three event, main event faces have made up, and they're in the ring with Gene, for, with Gene Okerlund for a, I guess, post-match promo. Hogan's not worried about his probation as Gene confronts him with hitting the ref, but he wants to know where Sting stands. Again, two weeks ago, he didn't care. Last week, he cared. This week, he cares again. But only as long as the promo is going on, because at the end of the promo, Sting's my friend and he'll always be my friend and Macho's my brother and blah, blah, blah. I mean, overall, it's a pretty decent promo. It just went way too long trying to stretch the fucking time out a little bit. Like the match itself went, I think it was nine minutes past the hour, which at the time was a bigger deal than it is now. Now that's sort of commonplace for that to happen. But back then it was a big deal because everything was was really regimented. Now, don't get me wrong. They're taking advantage of the fact that the NBA game wasn't going to be on the air for half an hour. And so they could cut into that as much as they wanted to. But trying to stretch it out to really eat into that second hour kind of made these promo, this promo and the promo with uh, Charles Barkley go just a little long in the tooth. So... It could have been done. There's another reason why it can't be done. It just the either the either the the promo itself had to be tighter or better, or they just had to stop. Like they just had to cut it off before everyone starts repeating themselves. Because everyone started repeating themselves, waiting for the cue to cut and go off. So trying to stretch out time. Uh, we end up back at the announce position where the stupid weasel bag of chips bullshits going over I, I still don't understand the fucking weasel thing but whatever it's just brain putting himself over i suppose um overall i gave this one probably the highest rating of any nitro to date a three and a half out of five for the actual show there was nine thousand in attendance only three thousand paid so the same amount of people that paid last week paid this week with an addition of four thousand extra bodies So we're still struggling to have people actually pay to watch this. It's mostly just the television audience to try to get. And that being said, this week, Raw was a 2.6. Nitro was a 2.4. So I expect next week that the ratings will pick up a little bit again because Raw was pretty good and Nitro was pretty good. So I expect the ratings to be closer to one another, but I kind of am looking for Nitro to edge them out a little bit. And I'm also kind of looking for the actual attendance to kick it up a notch too, because next week's show will be the night after In Your House 5. And 
the arena they're going to has a maximum seating capacity of just over 5,000. So it's not going to be a huge arena to try to fill up. It's going to feel tighter. It's going to feel a little, well, I don't know. I guess we'll see when we go to review it, but I just, I, I got this feeling that it's not going to be the huge fucking deal that this, you know, that this week's was where you had a much larger arena trying to fill it by giving away like, 6,000 tickets. You only you only sold a third of your tickets, which is sort of sad. So hopefully this picks things up and it is what it is. Uh, like I said, we've got three more shows before the end of the year Nitro, the end of 95 Nitro. We'll go over what, you know, what the accolades and awards were for WCW, as well as we'll talk a little bit about uh, Starcade because uh, we're going to lead into 96 and uh, 96 starts off with um, WCW actually doing uh, much, much better. Much, much better. I still am missing a lot of numbers, just looking at my stuff, but the ratings, the ratings are starting to kick it up a little notch. So it's good, but we're going to see what ends up happening with it all as we go through it, all right? All right, that's it for me this week. I'm out of here, crazy bastards. Feel free to comment in the YouTube bullshit and share it around. Hey, look. The fucking podcast costs a couple bucks to make every month, and we're breaking even. That's always good. So spread it around. Make sure I can afford to pay the jackass producer who keeps trying to get me in trouble with YouTube. Well, that was an abortion of a show. Should the mood take you, check out markoutradio.com and leave a comment. You can also find links there to our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Stitcher channels. You can even leave a voicemail on our Skype. Just click the links and share them. 